The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Hi, I'm Lara Demozak, and welcome to another Canola School episode here on realagriculture.com. Joining me today is Brianne Tideman, research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada at Lacombe. Welcome, Brianne. Thanks for joining hey. me today. Thanks for having me. You did a presentation at Saskatchewan Agronomy Research Update pretty recently, and uh, you did some very interesting uh, a canola update for us. So... What were the objectives of the project? Because you inherited a pretty unique project. Tell us about it. I did. So I inherited this project from Dr. Neil Harker, who was my predecessor at Lacombe. Uh, And by the time the project finished, which was last field season, uh, we had had 12 years of continuous canola. Uh, And that was in comparison to uh, a one year out of canola to a two year out of canola rotations. So the objective and and really where this came from was um, comments that we hear when we are promoting rotational diversity. Uh, And that that comment is, I can make more money doing either continuous or short short rotation canola, canola wheat, basically, than I can with a diverse rotation. And it's, it's interesting because that's a very economics or profit-based comment. Um, But Neil started wondering about the economics or the profit of that, as well as what other risks are you taking in terms of weeds, in terms of insects, in terms of disease. And so he set this project up to to try and look at that. So the project was set up at five locations in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, Let's see if I can actually list them. Lacombe and Lethbridge in Alberta. Mm -hmm and Melfort, Scott, and Swift Current in Saskatchewan. Yeah. Um, which, and covers, which covers quite a, a, a range of soil zones and, and kind of climatic zones. Yeah, so, yeah, so it, it covers uh, a, good, a good chunk of, uh, of the prairies that way, which is nice. Um, at the Egg Canada locations, which is why it's, it's at those five specific locations working with our AFC network. Um, and basically what he wanted to compare was continuous canola, to canola one and two, um, so a canola wheat rotation, to canola one in three, so a canola, peas, barley rotation. And that was done with both herbicide tolerance packages that we have in Western Canada, so that that part was considered as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was done all phases. So if you have a canola wheat rotation, you also have a wheat canola rotation right beside it, so that you have all crops in all years, so that if... Say, as an example, you have a year, a really horrible drought year Mm -hmm. that knocks your wheat yield way down. Well, that's not really a fair comparison then to a continuous canola necessarily. So we wanted to have all phases so that that's kind of accounted for. What other things did you measure? So yield is obviously the big one. Um, We also looked at um, weeds. Obviously, weed scientist, I have to say the weeds first. Of course. Uh, both pre spray and post spray. Mm-hmm. Um, we looked at insects. So we looked at cabbage root maggots. Um, we looked for a couple other ones too, uh, based on the different areas, but that's, that's the one that was really steady across all locations. And we also looked at diseases. So blackleg being, again, our most um, stable disease, I guess would be the right word. We did look for club root. We didn't have any at any of our locations. Uh, sclerotinia. Sclerotinia is notorious for being fickle. Um, and it was in this project as well. Mm-hmm. So black leg was the most stable of the diseases that we measured. Or the most consistent, um, you could say. Yeah. 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 That yep. might be the right word. Yep. Um, we also had uh, some soils colleagues doing some measurements, looking at soil microbial biomass and rhizosphere and biome, microbiome, and other soils words that I don't know, and you're probably shaking your head at me for, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> More soil stuff as well. Yeah. So. And so yeah. the the previous, you know, Neil's research results, can you tell us what happened with those? Yeah. In so regards the, to the yield and the, and the insects and the diseases. I can. So the first six years, Neil has published on already. So... 
the trends that he saw um, for every year out of canola, your yield increased. And it was a linear relationship. Um, so what that means is, and I would have to look at the actual uh, yield number that he had. He published up to 2013. This is up to 2016. Um, but what he saw was a five bushel an acre increase. So if you move from continuous to canola to a canola one and two rotation, you gain five bushels an acre. Okay. And if you went from one and two to one and three, you gained an additional five bushels an acre. Wow. So a 10 bushel per acre increase. We had a lot of variability in that between sites and years and all of that kind of stuff, but that was averaged across all sites in all years. Um, conversely, for every year out of canola, we saw a decrease in damage from root maggots. Mm -hmm. And we saw a decrease in frequency and severity of black leg. So increased yield, decreased pest pressures. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds, sounds fabulous. That right? Sounds great. Um, now, in terms of economics, because that's always the question we get is back to that whole profit question. Um, we do have an economist working on the project with us. They haven't gotten their hands on all of the data because it just finished in 2019 and COVID and, you know, yep. all the recent stuff. So um, Neil and I, being weed scientists, did what we call our cowboy economics. So not economist-based. This is weed scientists trying to run economics. But uh, when we look at our net returns, what we were seeing was, again, averaged across all sites and all years, um, there was really no significant differences between the treatments which is actually a good thing. So what we're told is I can make more money growing short rotation canola. And what this is showing us is in the long term, at least, that's not necessarily true. You can make just as much money in a three-year rotation as you can continuous canola. I think you just nailed the take-home message for farmers right there. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, it is preliminary. It's cowboy economics. It needs an economist to actually dig into it and, and see how much or how badly the weed scientists messed up. <laughs> um, but that's sort of what we're seeing. And when you're looking at that, it doesn't take into account a lot of the other risks of continuous canola. You know, you're, you are selecting for resistance breakdown to black leg, to club root, to whatever other pathogens that you right. have. You're selecting for uh, a buildup of insect pressures. You're selecting for herbicide resistance. Weeds, woo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Back to my weeds. <laughs> if, you're, if you're using... Um, you know, your, your herbicide tolerance traits, your glyphosate, your glufosinate, you're putting more selection pressure on, on those products for resistance in the weeds. Right. Um, now, the last three years, 2016 to 2019, the most recent three years, we had a bit of an interesting shift in yield. So up till 2016, we had that linear increase in yield. When we look at just the final three years, we start to see what was actually more what we expected mm -hmm. or we, Royal We, Neil and others when they started the project, yeah. um, what they expected to see when they started the project, which is that you get your biggest increase in yield from moving from a continuous to a one and two rotation. You get still get an increase in yield, but it's a smaller increase in yield going from one and two to one and three. So it was like a, I think it was a five bushel per acre increase or something like that, seven, seven bushel per acre increase from continuous to one and two, and then only a two bushel per acre increase from one and two to one and three. Hmm. So smaller yield benefit, which again is is what we expected initially. But again, that doesn't take into account all those other risks. Right. So, and, and why it shifted? I don't know. Not yet. There could be um, some environmental factors or, yeah. or something could be. like... Uh, Volunteer canola, confounding that kind of, that measurement? Yeah, absolutely. So there, there's a lot of things there that, that could be playing into it. It could also just be that the first up to 2016 is averaged over nine years and the last three years are only averaged over three years. Right. So when we put all that data together, we might get a bit of a different trend as well. Right. So all of these results, Neil's first six years of data are solid. Those are published. Since 2014 to 2019, all of those results are still preliminary. We're still working through all the analyses on them. Um, sometimes in projects you run into, I don't know how to analyze this, or I, I 
wish I had this other data so that I could do this other analysis. Mm -hmm. This project is far more going to be where do I stop analyzing? Yeah, <laughs> there is so much data with 12 years by five sites by all of these rotations. There's so much data that I could look at and play with and analyze different ways that I think it's going to be harder to stop analyzing. Well, that's the <laughs> to find things to analyze. That's the fun in research, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see what kinds of information you can pull out of that data set. And, and thanks so much for, for joining me here today for my, my first ever interview with Real Agriculture. And I'm honored to be your first interview. It's good and fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope to catch you, catch you soon for the, for the next round of, or an update of, of what you got for us. So. Yeah, I, I think you'll be hearing about this project for a few years as I dig more and more into it, because I think there's some cool things to find. Thanks so much, Brianne. Thank you.